Hello fans and welcome to Reflections. I'll tell you what, in the state of pro wrestling today and the way it is and the disconnect it has with the fans, it's an honor for me to be sitting with a man, a tough man, a legend in the business. Somebody who when you stepped in the ring and you saw him as a fan, you knew it was believable and you, and you were afraid because this man, he might just kick your ass. <laughs> Here he is. The Raging Bull, Manny How How Fernandez. Thank you so right, much man. for being here. Hey, no problem, man. Anytime I get something to give back to pro wrestling, I get to take that opportunity. Right. Because uh, it done so much for me. But uh, you, you know, when you open statement, and you said things are going on. Say the wrestling today is a whole lot different than it was in the days where the guys were respectable and respected business. Business was respected. Sure. In the sense that, uh, you know, guys didn't have to go around proving themselves because the people respected what they did in the ring and was believable. It, you know, I had a negative effect on the business to me. It's just, I didn't think anybody else wanted to learn the old style. Right. And once I got a ring with this kid, I realized this kid was a damn good kid. Some bitch listened. He didn't do anything but follow me. He listened. We had a great, fantastic match, and the guy was unbelievable. So there's hope in the business. There is some guys out there. Sure. So, I mean, you know, I look at my kids that I started in this business and some that are still going strong, like Homicide and Low Key and those guys. and. The, the hit squad kids and Ivan, little Ivan, crazy Ivan. Those guys are still, but they learn the old way. I taught them the old way, just listen. Right. Listen and, and, and take a good kid and groom them. If they listen, talk about it. Right. And you don't have to sit there and explain your match to each other. Go out there and fly by here. And none of them listen and say, my guys, they don't use the ropes. They can go out there for 10 minutes without touching the ropes. That's unheard of nowadays. You think you have to hit the ropes and ropes and ropes and ropes. Hell, I watched a match on uh, Facebook one time and it was, uh, copycat of uh, the Wolverine movie where they just did flip after flip after flip and kneel down and bend down and look at each other. I was mean, that the Ricochet match? Was ricochet that from Japan? Match. I mean, come on, dude. It's it's called wrestling. So you're not a fan of that style? No, it's called wrestling. I mean, by, there were many people, many people were calling that the greatest match in the history of pro wrestling. Oh, right, really? What match was it? I, I mean, there's no wrestling in it. I understand. I mean, you take a guy in the old days, you can take a guy like me, this old shooter that loves wrestling. Takes you down. It's like a guy saying, oh, we do help for us and light bulbs and everything. I said, really? When I shoot on you, stick your head up your ass and you can't breathe. Right. That's going to be more than that light bulb because you're choking to death. Right. And that's basically what the old timers like Dez and Gotch and all those good shooters that taught me this business would tell you. They get in the ring and you do all that flipping and flopping and all of a sudden they shoot single leg. You tie you up and put you out of your leg and give you serious real pain and you're going to sit there and cry like a baby. I actually got put in prison for two and a half months because... Guy ripped me off for twenty grand. I try to kill him. I will kill you when you when you steal from the veterans. Recently, yeah, recently, yeah, about a year ago. Yeah, when you steal from people that are already down and people that are veterans and that served this country in one way or another, either in peace time or war, you don't steal from people like that. How I got to West Texas State. I was a crazy ass kid. First guy played football with a tattoo in nineteen seventy seven. Right. Nobody had tattoos in college. Nobody had tattoos. I was one of the crazy guys that went to university that had Dick Murdoch, Blackjack Mulligan, Dusty Rhodes, Terry Funk, Joey Funk, Ted DiBiase, Tito Santana, Tully Blanchard. How I ended up there, my mom sent me there. She, right. she got tired of the nightmares and me cowering in the closet and having nightmares and thinking about, hey, incoming, 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 you know. And uh, she sent me this college and told me I could play football again. I told her I'd never play the game again because I don't know how to play it no more. I learned a different way of life and it's not a good way. It's just a way of taking people out. Yeah. You know, and it, I, I can't do that on a football field anymore. She goes, just try it. And she convinced me to go back and try it. I can end up at West Texas State. I ended up getting on a big fight first day. <laughs> you? <laughs> I ended up getting the first day, uh, the first day in, in training camp or the first day reporting to training camp. I, you slept, still slept with a 45 under my pillow, and guys tried to thought I was an incoming freshman, so they're gonna rip me. You know, they they, they rag you, so they dental floss in my toes together. Next thing they do is looking down the barrel of a 45. It's <laughs> <You know? laughs> not what you expect in a college no, dorm. They, not what they expected. Right. Not what they expected. They thought they were getting an incoming freshman. They found out I was not an incoming freshman fast. Right. No. You no, know, I never wanted to be pro wrestler. No, hell no. Right. You know, I knew about the guys, and I watched Ted DiBiase. And I knew about DiBiase playing at West Texas, but he didn't play ball. He right. He was a warmer, you know. So that, that gave me a, a negative thought. It built this guy up on TV like he was a big star at West Texas football. He didn't so big, they paid it down. <laughs> he never even started. <laughs> right. You know, so that kind of threw me off, you know, the bullshit. But that's, I guess that's the phase of working. 
Who sure. showed you the ropes inside the ring? Who who taught you psychology? Who taught you the moves? Well, psychology got beat into my head by Murdoch and Mulligan and Funk and Funk and Sweet Hansen and a guy named Dennis Stamp. Dennis Stamp. They literally got beat in my head. I mean, I had lumps on my head. Every time I thought I could go off, I'd bam! I was gone. <laughs> you know, I ended up with lumps, about 20 lumps on my head after one day. My education came with Carl Gotts and Luthez and Hill Matsuda and Jack and Jerry Briscoll. All them guys stretched the living crap. Well, I, was, I thought I was the greatest. Right. So they taught me. <laughs> they taught me. They busted me up for an hour. And then when I got through with them, I was walked out. I was embarrassed. And Dusty Rhodes and uh, Eddie Graham came down, and they told Dusty. And Thez told Dusty, he called the kid. He's right. Murdoch's right. This kid's tough. I go, tough. Tough my ass. You guys whip my ass. You guys 77 years old whip my ass like that. <laughs> he goes, yeah, but you didn't quit like the rest. He goes, that I'll never do. I will never quit on nothing. I didn't know how to quit, you know. Right. You know, if I would have quit, I probably would have quit in Vietnam. So. Dusty, uh, Murdoch, the, the ones that hurt the most and the one that I cannot wait and I pray never happens is Terry Funk. Mm. Me and Terry Funk are about as close as you'll ever get uh, brothers, you know, as close as he and his brother Dory are. I've had that man in my life, 40 years of my life. He, he came and dropped the title to me when I was green, eight months in the business. He told Lady Graham, he says, I bet you this kid will draw money and keep drawing money. Just put the belt on him. I didn't want no part of that. See, back then, it's a whole different story. Now nobody has to draw. It's all made. Money's made. Right. Nobody has to draw. Right. Tully, you know? Speaking of Tully Blanchard, you and him have, uh, you, you've had a lot of things to say about Tully over the years. Um, there's nothing else to say. He's a coward. Right. <laughs> what else do you say about a coward? Right. I stand there and get stabbed eight times for a coward to run away from me. It's a coward. In your state now, when you're doing conventions, uh, have you ever been in the same vicinity in modern oh, yeah, day? Tons and lots of times, and I just wanted to come and punch the lights out again. <laughs> you just get old and get tired. You know, the guy can't fight number one, and you, you know, it's, bottom line's a coward. You know, and I don't care if I'm 100 years old. If you, you disrespect me, I'm gonna still fight you. Right. You might kick my butt. And I'm gonna be in wheelchair. You knock me out in wheelchair. Be, I'm still get up and fight you if I have to bite you in the ankle. Right. And, you know, I'm gonna fight till the day I die. Has That's he ever tried big. to approach you? Like no, no, he's never tried to approach me after that fight in uh, the Crockett Cup in Baltimore. No, no. In fact, if one for rude or barbarian, I'd probably kill the son of a bitch. Mm. Wouldn't matter to me. It's, it's to the point in my life right now. I'll take you out. It doesn't matter. What are they gonna do? Lock me up? They already locked <laughs> me up for two and a half months in prison. You sat there and you helped somebody out. I got stabbed eight times, nearly died, and he took off running down the street yelling, "He's got a knife." Then he wants to sit there and tell people well, I couldn't let him in my Cadillac because I just bought the brand new Cadillac. Didn't want to get blood on my upholstery. Mm. So you're gonna leave me there to die. That's like me leaving a brother in Vietnam when he got wounded, not going back and get him. I don't leave him behind. See, I, everything in my life is pro-military. I can't leave a brother down. Right. It's like when Rick Rude came to me and said, "Hey, bro, I got a better deal in New York." Okay, go. What do you want me to tell him? No. Don't take the deal. You're my partner. Right. No. I said, get the hell out of here. Go make money. We're in this business to make money. Go make all the money in the world you want. Right. You're freaking to have a family. What do you I've think about? What do you think about him finding religion? Yeah, I found religion too, but I'll kill you in a second. <laughs> then I'll pray to God for forgiveness. Okay. That's the kind of religion I believe in. Right. He, he, if you believe that person found, it's like you know, everybody. Hey, here we go. Same analogy. Everybody in prison finds religion. Correct? Right, right. You kill 10,000 people and you go to prison and all of a sudden you're a holy roller and you found religion. Right. I didn't find religion in prison. In fact, I beat up three guys in prison got put in isolation. <laughs> they put me in a thing called the shoe for a month. You know what I told them? I love it here. Leave me in here. It's like POW training, bro. See, <laughs> Vince, see. when I told Vince to go fuck himself, he thought I'd be What year was that? Oh, God. Uh, 91, something like that, when me and Rude were breaking up. Well, right. Not breaking up. We just went... He went to go make more money. He was right. getting robbed. I was making half a million dollars a year. He was making 150000 a year. That's kind of like robbing a guy. Mm -hmm. You know, so he he did his thing, and I didn't stop him. I, I told him flat out. I said, hey, dude, I signed with Japan. Don't feel bad. I, right. I left. That's when the politics started. Did he feel bad? Did he feel bad leaving you? No. Why would he? Why would he? He knew I was covered. He knew I was covered. You know, I had a contract for two more years. He didn't. Right. You know, I signed a big five-year deal, you know, and he signed a three-year deal. So, you know, it was basically up. Plus, I had to deal with Japan. And right. I wanted to go shoot. I got tired of the politics in the ring, the four horsemen kissing their ass. We all drew them everywhere we went. Me and Rude and Rock and Roll Express, went to, they went to Hawaii and did 7,000 people. We went to 
Florence, South Carolina, do 22,000 people. Mm. <laughs> if you have ballet in the ring, I mean, you have one fantastic match. And boom, and this thing is going 40 something minutes. Yeah, I don't know it's going 40 something minutes because I'm having fun just listening to this crazy man doing this, that. Next thing I know, I'm in a spinning toe and boom, 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 it's small package. Small package, one, two, three, and a it sounded like a damn, I even almost ducked. I thought it was incoming. Right. And the crowd exploded. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, incoming, incoming. And it just erupted, man. And it was just like, like right now, I'm telling the story and I got goosebumps. For sure. I rest. have goosebumps. I got goosebumps. And, and, and Terry goes, you did it, kid. And I was like, what did I do? Yeah, the coke here, you know, we all have fun. The people can deny all they want, but, you know, we all have vices and we all... You know, that, this is, let's talk about that a little bit because that era is notorious, like, when, when people go back and look at it for the drug culture that, and everything that was going on. And it's, right. and it's blamed for a lot of the early demises. And, yeah, and, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people don't know when it... I always had a theory about that, I was, and I tell people, to, even today, you control the drug, don't let the drug control you, you'll right. be okay. You know, don't ever let it be to the point that you're going to go die for it or do something, you know, rob or steal or do anything right. like that. Then you're out of control. Right. You're out of control. And, and we lost a lot of good friends that way, you know. Yeah. That's the sad part about this business. Me and yeah. Hawk were legit. Me and Hawk used to beat up here pretty often. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and Hawk and me got coked up in Chicago one night. We killed half the bar. <laughs> 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 no, Animal was a straight guy. He was not, no, Animal was just a big, I call him melon head. And right. a big steroid in forehead and <laughs> <laughs> animal. It's still this day I still mess with but you know. You know legitimately one, tough. Legitimately tough. Legitimate. Legitimately tough. Big word. Yeah. Yeah. This this tough. lends into the theory that Tony Atlas is saying everybody turns their back right. and here's Dutch Mantel riding with him, hanging with him, and he doesn't know what happened. Yeah. And then uh, like I said, he's office stooge. It's what you call an office stooge. Right. He's a booker for Puerto Rico, he's over there. Dutch Mantel's always been a chicken shit anyway. Right. It's been telling much about the thing I learned about pro wrestling a long time ago is there's certain tough guys that can carry themselves and carry this business, and now there ain't no guys. There ain't the Murdochs, there ain't the Funks, there ain't the Mulligans, the guys that can really carry the business. You know, right. you know Brock Lesnar, everybody thinks he's tough. <laughs> Velasquez made him look like a punk. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes down to really fisticuffs and fighting for your life, what's it going to do to take to survive, bro? You got to know how to fight, uh, fucking go down on yourself to the point of fucking life or death. If you're willing to give up your life for it, then you fight for it. And that's the way I fight. If you're going to hurt me, I'm going to kill you. Right. If you take one of mine, I'm going to take two of yours. That's what I believe. That's the way I am. Sure. Stan Hansen liked him, speaking of Brody. Stan thought he was great. I would, never give, uh, I would never give credit to Stan on having brains either. I wouldn't give credit to fucking Ole Anderson and have balls. He tried messing with me one time in the ring. I slapped the hell out of him. Sitting there with uh, Thunderbolt Patterson, kept trying to stretch him and stuff. Thunderbolt Patterson was a little busted up. I said, tag me. And I, I reached over and tagged him. I come in and waff, waffled him across the face, bitch slapped him across the face. I said, now go, motherfucker, let's do it. Let's do this shit. And he just backed off, tagged on Anderson. Only Anderson ain't got a fucking ball one. He acts like a tough guy. When he was in Atlanta beating up people, him and whoever he was with in Atlanta, that he, he wouldn't have said that to Brody's face, Brody's face to kick his face in. Right. I hear a lot of negativity about Ole Anderson. He's bitter. Uh, He's a bitter-ass punk. Right. It's like people say about me. All that, but I don't take shit from anybody. Right. Well, it's like I tell people, what are you going to do, kill me? Been there already. You know, I've been shot twice, stabbed eight times. Right. Vietnam, I've been dead. It's like I told Homicide in the promo. So I've been dead since Vietnam, bro. What you going to do, hurt me?